it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey everybody and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here and this is a special bonus episode just for everybody where we talk about chicks. 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 And more chicks. And more chicks. We drink a ton. I'm talking a ton of coffee. But most importantly... We hug our chicks every day. We hug our chicks every day! And kiss them, too. Don't forget to kiss them. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Coffee, coffee. Holly, and what kind of coffee are we drinking today? A very strong Colombian. Colombian. So, if you like great coffee and scones and homemade cookies, anything like that... In your local, head over to Coffee Coffee and you will not be disappointed. Let me just take a minute to tell everybody about Iowa Blue Farm. It's a woman-owned, family-run, all-natural chicken treat company in the Midwest. And we love supporting those women-owned businesses. 1,000%. They make 100% all-American oven-dried black soldier fly grubs for all types of poultry. And I'm talking if you have chickens, if you have ducks, turkeys, peacocks, quail, you can feed these grubs. They're high in calcium and protein, and they love them. They do. Good source of concentrated protein and calcium. My flock comes running for them. They lose their minds when they see the blue bag. The blue bag keeps them running. The other thing Iowa Blue has is they make an excellent organic feed, both in layers and with growers. Right. So we have a video up on our Instagram page of us opening this bag and showing you what this feed looks like. It's amazing. It's packed full of nutrients. It's exactly what they need in protein. It's an excellent food. It's really good stuff. Fresh grains. It's not dusty at all. No. My chickens go crazy for this Mine food. Mine are going crazy over this they food love also. It. So if you want to go over and give them a try, go to iowabluefarm.com. And when you decide you want to try it, go in under the coupon code and put COFFEE, all caps, 25. And Iowa Blue Farm is giving anyone who's listening to us and hearing this 25% off site-wide their first order. And this is an excellent deal. That's a really good value. It is a good value and it's a good way to try something and see if it works for you and get a little bit of a discount. This stuff is high quality and you will not go wrong. Coupon code COFFEE with all caps, 25, anything you choose. For your first order. For your first order, you can't go wrong. So go ahead over iowabluefarm.com and give them a look. They're baked with love. Shipped with care. And and shipping is always always free. free. So this is a special bonus episode, Chicks 101. Yep, we are bringing you all the information about raising chicks. This is the first time that we've kind of gone a little bit off our usual regimen of how we do an episode. Yeah, no segments. We're really going to pack this one with information for you. Yeah, we feel like the time that this is coming out is right when everyone's going to start getting chicks. Right. So we want you to be able to go back and re-listen if there's something that you want to learn about. And we want to pack this as much as we can with useful information for you. Right. So this is really aimed at the person who has never had chickens before or has never had chicks. Right. We're going to tell you all about what we do and some of the facts and the science around chicks. Right. But it also might be interesting for someone who's an old hand but just hasn't had chicks lately. Right. So if you haven't had chicks in a few years. Right. When I worked in the veterinary medicine world, just as everything... Technology improves year after year. Yeah, it's very true. Things change. What we're doing this year is a lot different than what we did 20 years ago. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So as technology comes up with the times, everything changes. So even if you've had chicks before, it might be a good idea to give it a listen. So what we're going to do is kind of start at ground zero for chicks. Yep. And chick development. Yeah, so like some basic physiology of how a chick develops in the egg. So we're just going to, we're not even going to talk about variables. We're just going to give you the basic science here. Let's just just get the facts out for everyone on the chicks and the eggs. So chicks develop in fertilized eggs. Correct. The eggs have to be at a minimum of 99.5 degrees. Right. And the chicks grow over a 21-day period. 
So the chicks are going to be in this 99.5, and that's generally why chickens usually only go broody when it's warm. Right, exactly. Their temperature has to be up also. Exactly. And they have to be able to sit on those eggs, or you can use an incubator. Right, so you can use an incubator. You set it right at 99.5. Right. If the eggs are being hatched by a mama birdie hen, right. her internal temperature is usually like 105 to 106. Exactly. So the eggs with her feathers and her breasts, are, it's going to keep them very warm. Yeah, but uh-huh. generally chickens go broody in the spring. Absolutely. When the weather and the temperature yep. gets up. Yep. So in that perfect little egg, there is a yolk. Yep. It's amazing how quickly the chick develops. Yes. So it's quick. It really is. So by day three, veins and blood vessels have formed. Right. The brain and the heart have formed by day three, and the heart has begun to beat. That is amazing. That quickly. By day five, the eyes have formed. Wow. By day eight, you have a beak, wings, and legs. And nine is feather follicles beginning to form. Right. And the feathers will continue to grow throughout the the rest of the period. By the end of the second week, you pretty much have a fully formed chick. Right. They continue to grow and absorb the nutrients from that egg yolk. And it's pretty amazing. That one yolk powers the entire development of one perfect chick. It is. The whole process is amazing. It really is. I mean, when you think about it, they come out fully with their little peach fuzz feathers yeah. that those start on day nine and continue to grow while the chick's in the egg. And like you said, that one egg yolk powers all of this little chicken to grow. It really does. It's freaking amazing, honestly. It is. So like day 20, 21, the chicks will pip. Right. And that's when they start knocking with our eggshell. And this is what we wanted to bring up, that if you're hatching your own, you're going to see it. Yeah, definitely. If you're getting a chick fairly quickly, you're going to see what's called the little egg tooth. Yeah. And it's what they use to get out of the egg. Right. It's like a little sort of bump on the end of their beak, the top of their beak. And they use this, they tap it against the shell, and they sort of go all the way around the shell. try to break it. Exactly. The tooth will fall off after a couple of days. Right. But what work it has to do. This is really exhausting work for the chick. It can take them hours and hours. It's hard to, I think I've never seen it happen, but it has to be hard to be a person and watching hours and hours. But as somebody who's given birth to two children, Uh it's safe that I'm sure it is. It's hard to. (laughs) If you're hearing anything in the background, that is Grayson. It's Grayson. He has a lot to say. He always does. (laughs) So after the chick finally gets free of the egg, then they need time to rest and dry off. Right. And that egg yolk that they consumed in the egg, in the shell, is still nourishing them for a couple of days after they're born. So for a while, if you listen to us on a regular basis, you're going to hear some stories about broody hens and everything Uh, when we talk with Fiona. But this is just straight chicks. So if you're having an incubator and you have the chick in there, the chick's going to need to stay in there for a little while to dry off before you take it out. Right. The Uh, primary need is heat right. and rest. So heat. you need to let them dry off and let them rest. And exactly. if you have a broody hen, she's going to be doing that herself. Right, right. So she's going to be staying on the chick. So it's good to know like which way they're going to go. You have to give them a little bit of time. Right. You don't want to just take them, grab them and start. No, no, definitely let them rest, let them stay warm. And dry off is the I crucial mean, thing. honest to God, it is so amazing. It really is. That this egg comes out it's fertilized, and then 21 days later, you have a chick. Exactly. I mean... If everything is right. If, if it's fertilized, if it has all the yes, temperatures it needs. Right. Exactly. So then, what we want to get into is where to find chicks if right? you don't hatch your own. Yes. So if you don't hatch your own, and what's big in the U.S. is one-day-old chicks. Right. Uh, either that you go to a farm supply store that's near you, a local one, or you have them shipped to you. Hi, everyone. We just want to note that we recorded this episode before our own chicks had been shipped, and that shipping for both 2020 and 2021 has been extremely irregular. We just want to advise you to think carefully before you choose to have your chicks shipped this year. If you have local breeders. Local breeders, which, sorry, I forgot about the local breeders, or if you want to drive take a road trip right take a road trip you can you can usually buy chicks from breeders that way or you can order them from a hatchery a hatchery in which this year that is what we're doing yes 
So where to find it? And this is what we can talk about the different places. Your local farm store, we have one called The Mill. Right. Which sells local farm supplies to farms all around our area and our state. And they do the shipping in of the chicks. So what happens is if you go to your local farm supply store, they will have a list usually right. of the chicks that they're scheduled to get in weekly. Yeah, their breeds. And you can look at the breeds and see if any of those interest you and plan accordingly to those dates. In a normal year, that would be pretty foolproof. Yeah. But the past two years with shipping difficulties, etc., sometimes shipments are coming in late or they're not coming at all. I've been a victim of it myself. Right. Where, and sometimes the hatcheries just change up, and that's what happened to me. Uh-huh. When they were supposed to have speckled Sussex and they didn't. Yeah, because it's not always a perfect process. So that's the one place. Now, if you want to be secure in what you get, you can search for breeders. Right. Or you can go to the hatcheries. Right. And that's what we opted to do because there were several breeds that we wanted and we wanted them all at the same time. Right. So you actually have to check with the hatchery and make sure they're going to have that breed hatching on that week. Right. And we did find all of our breeds hatching on the same week. They were shipped together. Yeah, and we chose a hatchery that we respect for their humane treatment of their chickens. Correct. So, that again, that was our choice this year. We really would want to buy from breeders, but just it didn't, it didn't work out this year. Right. In the future, that might be something that we do. Right. And where you can find breeders, you can check the Livestock Conservancy. Absolutely. They have lists on there of the breeders. Yes. And also, if you just check around on social media. Yeah, sometimes there are Facebook groups for a breed. Right. Or you just stumble across some people who are local to you, and you might find they have some interesting breeds. So the other thing is, when you're looking for chicks, you're going to come across some different things. So you might have a sexed chick or what's called a straight run. Right. And it's good to know what these things mean. Yes. So sexing chicks is difficult. It really is. Hatcheries employ professional chick sexers, literally professionals to do it. And even then there's still a five to 10 rate of error. Exactly. Yeah. So one out of every 10 is not going to be correct. Exactly. And if there's 55 sitting in the bin, right. there's some roosters yeah. in there. The other thing is some chickens are auto-sexing. Right. That's Yeah. And if you definitely cannot have a rooster or do not want to want to have a rooster, check out some of the auto-sexing breeds. One like, of which we're getting. Right. The yeah. cream-crested leg bar that we're getting are an auto-sexing breed. Right. So females and males look different at birth. Right. And straight run means unsexed. So if you get your chicken straight run, prepare for some roosters. Yeah. With talking to Fiona, we found out that basically for every hen that hatches, a rooster does too. You know, I was or having, more or more. I was having a laugh with my sister the other day because when we got our first batches of chickens, we got the coach in straight run, and somehow we got lucky and had like six or eight hens and two roosters. Wow, just dumb luck. Yeah, that is. It does not always work that way. This is a story from last year. Someone that I know, her sister went out and bought chickens and chicks and thought she was getting six hens. And got five roos. Oh, boy. That's not good. No. So if you are buying chicks and if you don't want roosters, make sure they look, are not straight rod. Look rot. for the sign that says pullets. Yes. Because pullets means girls. Right. So if you have that, but like we said, it's usually a 90% Right. Correct. There is a margin of error there. There is. So if we move on, you're also, when you're looking for chicks, Merrick's vaccine is one of those things that you want to figure out if you want to do or not, or if the person or the hatchery offers it. Exactly, right. I choose to get my chickens vaccinated for Merrick's. Again, that's personal choice, and you probably want to do some reading on this. Right. And you can make the decision for yourself. Right, exactly. And again, as Christy said, it's widely available now. Our local farm supply store, The Mill, does get their chicks vaccinated for Merrick's. I would say don't assume that every store does it. You probably want to ask, make sure. Yeah, that's something some of the larger want. places I don't think do. Right, they don't always offer the vac- so vaccinated chicks. it is worth it to ask because yes. if you're raising these chicks and integrating them into another flock or into the, an existing flock, right. they can spread disease. So right. biosecurity is very important. So the Merrick's vaccine does help a little bit. Oh, definitely. Merrick's is a chicken disease that attacks, it can attack multiple symptoms of a chicken. Right. It can cause serious neurological issues. Right. It can attack the organs, the eyes, and often it manifests in young chickens. Right. Which is where the vaccine will give your chicks some protection. Exactly. protection. Yeah. So that's the one thing to check on. Now, both Holly and I always opt to have this. Once again, 
this is your own decision. Right. And it's worth looking up Merrick's and making an educated decision on whether or not you want your chicks vaccinated. Yes. And if you're lucky enough to have an avian vet, it might be a conversation you want to have exactly. with them. Exactly. There's also a coccidiosis vaccine. It's a reasonably new vaccine. It's not available widely yet. No. And coccidiosis is... It's a protozoa. Okay. Right, yeah. right. It's basically a parasite in an intestinal tract. Uh-huh. So with a little chick, it can cause big problems. It really can. This is where we're going to talk about medicated versus non-medicated food in a moment here. But there is a vaccine. Again, as we said earlier, it's not widely available. And the most important thing to know is if your chicks have had the vaccine, do not feed them medicated food. So the medicated food, they're going to keep coccidiosis down. Because exactly. they're killing. Them. Right. And it's medicated. So basically... If you don't have the vaccine, which again, we're saying is not widely available, it's a good idea to feed the medicated food. Definitely. Especially we at do. first. We do. We choose to do it. Again, it's a personal preference. Right. And again, we're going to talk about the medicated food in just a bit here. Yes. But the crucial thing to know there is that it's not an antibiotic in the food. No. It's amprolium, which is a thiamine blocker. Right. And the difference is, and we don't want to get too scientific here, being veterinary technician, Small animals, dogs and cats, are treated with something called Albon, uh -huh. and it does have an antibiotic in it. Right. So I think that's where some of the misconception it's comes. It's entirely possible. From because if you're worried about giving your chicks medicated feed because you don't want to use a broad-spectrum antibiotic, right. you are not doing that. You are just using a right. thiamine blocker to protect them from exactly. the And I honestly think that's where the confusion comes probably. in. Probably. You're probably right. Because in small animal like dogs and cats... That medication is used, which is an antibiotic. Right. Because them themselves, the protozoa, can cause bacteria overgrowth and everything in dogs and cats. Right. It's okay. different than in chicks right. and chickens. So it's two totally different things. Yeah. So whether or not to get the vaccine, first of all, and then whether or not we'll talk later about the medicated mm -hmm. food. So again, they're both personal preferences right. and where you want to go with it. And now we're going to talk about something else that can be a little controversial for people, and that is shipping chicks. Right. So shipping chicks via the United States Postal Service is actually an American tradition, and people will question, how is this safe or even humane? Right. So first of all, companies or hatcheries can't ship you one, two chickens. Exactly. There's always a minimum of them, and it varies based on time of year and temperature. Right. So some of them, you can get as small as three. Mm -hmm. So... In the beginning of shipping, sometimes it was problems for people because you couldn't get less than 15 to 20. Exactly. And that is for the safety of the chicks. Yes. So basically, the chicks, they eat the yolk. Mm -hmm. They can go up to 72 hours without right. eating. So they're mm -hmm. not starved. They're right. definitely nutrient packed at that point. Yes. Their primary need is heat. Is heat. And that's why you have multiple chicks in shipping. So you have the chicks placed in the box with bedding and a heat pack. Right. And they are always shipped express. Right. Which is the fastest that you can go. Yes. And we hope that our postal carriers know what they're shipping. Now, here's the thing. My mom and dad were, are both retired mm -hmm. United States postal carriers. Right. And my mom, who is an avid animal lover herself, would always talk fondly about when the chicks would come in and delivering them. She, she was a rural carrier. She was. Right. So she would take the chicks and deliver mm -hmm. them in the boxes, and she always took extra care. Now, you have to hope that there are a lot of people out there in the U.S. Postal Service that are seeing that these are live animals and the, chicks. The boxes are clearly marked. Yes. And actually, most post offices now will make you come and pick them up. Exactly. Which is fine. So, like, even when we talk about the mill, it's mm -hmm. our local farm store where we get all of our stuff, basically. Right. They usually go and pick them up at the at the post office. Yes, yes. So, the carriers, like my mom, she would drive them out. Mm -hmm. I'm rural as well, where we live now. Yeah. But it's the Manchester, Maryland post office. Right. Um, you do go pick them up. The, the ladies call you and say, your chicks are here. Yeah. And they're always really excited. They, we can hear them peeping in the box. Yeah. So, they're very well aware of what's in the box, and they do keep them as safe as possible. Possible. Oh, yeah. So they're definitely not something that is mismarked. They're, everyone right. knows exactly what's what in there. Right, what they're shipping. The other thing is that 
these chicks just spent a long time in an egg right. that's being rotated either by the hen or by the incubator right. manually or mechanically so that the egg is continually rotated right. as the chicks are developing and they're used to being in dark and being moved around. They're used the to The crucial it. thing is that they are warm and they're cuddled up with their friends and they generally come through shipping A-OK. The most important thing, you're right, is that they're warm. Mm-hmm. Number one. Number one, exactly. Is that they're warm. So, like, last year, the girls and I went to the store. We picked up our lavenders, mm-hmm. and we were supposed to pick up one olive acre, and they didn't hatch yet. And we were only getting one. Right. So, they're like, okay, you have to come back. The whole shipment didn't come in. Right, exactly. So, we had to go in and pick up one olive acre, and the girls just took turns, because we drove almost an hour to get these chicks. Right. Holding them, holding her so close and warm. Against her body heat. Mm-hmm. And that might be why Gertie is so attached to us holding it's her, too. It's entirely possible. She, I yeah. mean, from the very beginning, mm-hmm. that's what she's used to. So, you just have to keep them as warm as possible. That is the number one thing. Number one, and we'll touch on this again as we talk about setting up a brooder, but your chicks need to be like 95 degrees. Yes, for the first week exactly. at least. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's good. I I even have sometimes a little thermometer in my brooder just to keep it, a, an eye on the temperature. We have this awesome tool because, you know, Pete likes gadgets. Yeah. So literally it's like a little, I don't know, it looks, it looks a little bit like a flash drive. And you put it down in the brooder, press the button, and it gives an instant read. Oh, nice. And we can check the brooder temperature constantly. Nice. So, yeah, it's a really good thing. And if you're going to think about this, if you go to your local farm store, they're getting them shipped. Yes. It's just shipping to them versus you. It's true. The I mean, o- the only way that you can prevent this is driving to the breeder yourself. And, and even then, you are you're transporting driving, them. You're they might be able to them. see, right? You know, where they're not in a dark box with their friends, but exactly. Yeah. And the reality is, unless you're getting chickens from your next door neighbor, yeah, they're going to undergo some stress. To get them home. And the best thing you can do is keep them warm and get them into their brooder as soon as possible. Definitely. You know, you're not going to kind of get away from shipping a lot of times. Right, right. Unless you're driving or your neighbor. Well, no, not even driving because you're shipping them. So you're home. And I would suggest I do this every time before the chicks come is set the brooder up first before the chicks even arrive. Yes. So that I even get my heat sources on. That's important. If you have your brooder already at the maximum temperature, you can tuck your babies right in there. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So having that set up, what goes in the brooder? Bedding for your brooder. Yeah. Bedding for your brooder. I mean, we're trying to get everything in here. Yeah. I use pine shavings. Uh, We use shavings too. I tend to like the smaller ones. I I just feel like it gives the babies better cushion. Yeah. I can't go wrong with paper bale from the mill. They're pine shavings, but they're in a paper bale. Oh, those. Okay. 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 They're so soft. Yeah. Yeah. And they're so fluffy. I use those over there for everything. Uh Uh-huh. And they've worked continuously. Yeah, I really like soft shavings for them in a thick layer. I do a very thick layer. Um, I know some people use newspaper. I really don't like it for a couple of reasons. The first is that it can get wet and you have to change it quickly. The second is that they can slip and it can actually affect the way their legs grow. I do use newspaper, but do you know how? I put a layer of newspaper down. You don't even see the newspaper. Yeah, it's at the bottom. Yeah, and then the shavings all the top. Right, we're talking about just newspaper. There are some issues with it. Some people just use layers of paper towels. Which That's going to be expensive. It's probably fine. It would be expensive, but you'd have to change it pretty quickly because you can't have the babies running around. And The other thing about the shavings, which is really good, is, like you said, the shavings tend to cover up the poop. Right. Because you're not going to be able to get every little piece of poop out of there. Right. So they're not running through it, smashing it in their feet, and then eating right. it because off their right feet. right there, you've got a coccidiosis risk yeah. immediately. Yeah. Yeah. So the shavings worked for me every, every well, we've year. We've been using them for 20 years, and they worked just fine yeah. best, too. And like yeah. I said, I just put the newspaper on the very bottom to help absorb what comes through the shavings. Right. Like if they spill the water or yeah. something. Plus, it helps. If <laughs> this they is spill funny. The water. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. I roll. I use the paper to roll up the shavings. That's a good idea. To clean out. Yeah. And yeah. then I take the roll, which is like so thick, and uh-huh. throw it in the trash can. Yeah, that's perfect. That's a really good idea. I've always done that. And now we're going to move into basically care 
And feeding the chicks. Exactly. So we're going to talk about when you walk in the door, have the brooder set up. Right. Immediately after getting them in the brooder, watch them for a couple of minutes. You know what I do all the time is I show them the food and water instantly. That's what I was going to say. So generally, and this is probably old timer practice because we've been doing this. I dip their beak, each one in the water. We watch to see which is the most outgoing chick and we usually choose her. Gently dip her beak in the water, show her the food. She'll catch on pretty quickly and she'll show all the rest of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I do it to each and every one of them. Oh, okay. That's fine. I just take every one of them to the food and water. I've been doing that every single time. Okay. And I've never had a problem with them not seeing the water. Now, they'll make a mess. That's for sure. Well, they're going to. They're babies. Yeah. Babies make messes. They make big messes. That's interesting. I've always just done the one chick. I've done every single one. And, and you know, she'll show them. And, they, I mean, they're all eating and drinking within yeah. a few minutes. But yeah. that's, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, they're going to make a mess. They're going to poop in their water. They're going to kick stuff around their it's babies. It's the one it frustrating happens. thing is you're changing water like 20 times a day in there. You know what? Just give up on clean water. So literally, <laughs> just check it every, I don't know, as, as often as you can. I mean, Pete and I take turns. Oh, yeah. This is my hour. I the try as hour. they grow to put it up, up, up. Out of like the very first day, it's in the shavings. Yes. And then I use bricks to put it up so that it's out of the shavings. So, I mean, there's a whole process that you go through. And some of this has to do with your chicks, too. Like the Brahmas, those big sleepy giants, were crazy babies. And so they were constantly trying to get on top of the water, oh, on yeah. top of everything. Oh, yeah. They were really interesting little chicks. So now we should talk about the brooder itself. And there's different different options that you have. You can use a big storage bin. Like a big tote? Like a big, huge tote. Uh-huh. I use an 80-gallon tote. I think that's what ours is as well. You can use a galvanized tub. Yes. Which... I love those, but they're pretty expensive. They can be costly. I've also seen people use the, what are they made of? Like the horse troughs, the horse yes. troughs that are made of some kind of heavy plastic. Yeah. I've seen that. The other thing is, though, like even my 80 gallon tub was still like $70. Oh, yeah. They, they cost they're a lot. They're expensive. Yeah. So you can use pop ups. I would generally want to use a pop up after the first week or two because there's all air coming in. Right. Now, I use the big 80-gallon tote, and the walls come very high. Yes. So the first few days, you don't need a top. They can't get out of there. Right, can't. unless you're trying to protect them from something like a dog, a cat, exactly. a kid. Right. But the walls themselves keep the heat in. Yes, they do. It's true. So that's why I like that for the beginning. Yeah. And as they grow and feather, then I bring a pop-up in. It's amazing how fast they grow and how fast they need more space. They need more space. So the pop-up is a really good option for that. Yeah, and pop-ups, you can just order on Amazon and get them in a day or two. Yeah. And they're good to have. We talk about this on our normal episodes, first aid pop-ups. If you're having a problem with a chicken, you need a place for this chicken to be safe. The same pop-up can be used for a brooder. Right. So we're actually going the same route. We are going to use our big tote at first. Right. As they get bigger, we're going to move them into a pop-up. And Pete actually ordered a second pop-up to use when we take them outside. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Right. And then the other thing that a lot of people do is build a brooder themselves. Yeah. Wooden boxes. Wooden Uh boxes are great. Yes. It's also, if you do it tall enough, it can keep the heat in again. It gives you a place to hook something. So all those things are very good options. I've seen some on Farm Supply websites that look like like an octagon made out of vinyl panels. Oh, yeah. I think they snap together. I'm not sure. I've never seen them They also have like cardboard ones that you can buy at the store. Probably like a heavy cardboard. Something like that. But they don't look very tall. And the thing that people aren't going to understand is these chicks sit in the palm of your hand for a total of days and then they're going to be bigger they grow so fast so like the walls have to be tall or you have to have a lid on this and at a certain point the lid is not voluntary anymore no once they get a few more wing feathers they're going to be flying out of the brooder there's some that you can get they look like a little barn it's a cardboard yeah if you plan on keeping chickens for years, and it's almost better just to invest in something good that's yeah, going to work for you. Yeah, or build something good that will work long term. Because you're going right? to use it every year. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So now that you have your actual structure, then this is something that we've been going back and forth about, and it's brooder heat source. Right. So back in the day, all we had was a heat lamp. Heat lamp. And the wisdom was you would choose a red heat lamp. Yep. Because the red would let the chicks sleep easier at night. It was supposed to keep them calmer. 
Uh, yeah. Now, I've used heat lamps almost all the time. Right. I put it up. <laughs> My system is kind of funny. Like, this system is foolproof. It had worked for me. I put the tote on a little bit of a stack and then put blankets and everything under it because I put the brooder in my garage. Right. And then behind the brooder, I put a wood ladder that we have. Okay. Like a tall five foot wood ladder. Uh Uh-huh. So I start with different levels. So I'll put the heat lamp on the bottom rung of the ladder hanging over. Right. And then as they get bigger, I put it up another rung. Right. So that the heat is less and less on the brooder. Yeah. And the idea there is that as the chicks get older, they need less heat. And so also, the move heat, it by increments. you want to keep it so that it's away from the shavings exactly. as much as possible. Yes. That is where heat lamps become a major fire hazard. Right. And that is why new technology, as we keep talking about, technology becomes new. They discover new ways of doing things right. that are safer. And so, this year, this year, we're both taking the plunge. We bought Brincy Brooder Plates. Yes. So, we're going to try the safer route. And, you know, the heat lamp has never been bad for me, ever. No, I've never had any trouble with it either. But there are a few things I really like about the Brooder Plate. Yeah. The first is that it uses less power. Yeah. It only draws 12 volts. And the heat lamp is powerful. Yes. So yeah, you're really using is. a lot of electricity to run that. The heat plates run on the same radiant heat technology that the new coupe heaters use. And right. if you've listened to us, you know that we're really a fan of these panel coupe heaters. Right. They're very, very safe. They're very eco-friendly as far as not drawing that much electricity. And the surface doesn't even get hot enough to burn. Yeah. The chicks, the shavings, anything. Right. So you're going to feel better when you have to leave the house. Mm-hmm. And believe me, this light, the heat source can never go off right you you can't just turn it off during the day your chicks must have that heat yeah and the first week or two it cannot be below 95 degrees right so you know this is something that you can again look up online Mm -hmm. and purchase it and have it delivered we have our you know we're already going right so this is something that we like Again, personal choice. It's a, it's a good thing to think of if you have any fears of the heat lamp. Yeah. And the, literally, the burner plate, it looks like a table. It has and, legs. And it rises as the chicks get larger. Right. So you can... Apparently, you can even put one end of it up. Right. But you would push it up so the table as it gets get higher, higher and higher. Right. As the chicks need less heat. You can also adjust it based on your breeds. Like, if you only have bantam babies, you can right. keep it pretty low. Right. If you have a bigger breed, you can pop it up a little bit. I have been told by friends who use this that as the chicks get bigger, they like to roost on top of the plate, too. I'm sure. Which, it <laughs> would probably still be warm. Probably. Yeah. All these things, like, it feels like this is pretty serious talking, but we just want to get these things out for that are the facts. Right. And let everyone kind of look at things and make their decisions. Having chicks in reality is really fun and it's a great family experience as long as you're prepared. Right. So this is why it's a little bit more of a serious episode, but we just want everyone to know all the facts out there. And oh, yeah. I mean, being able to listen to us while you're working or driving, you know, lets you absorb some of this information rather than having to pour through book after book. Yeah. The back of the brooder prayed a little bit. It's, it's a little bit of an experiment because there are a couple of questions I wanted to answer. Right. And we both have heat lamps on the side in case we need them. Right. We do. But I'm wondering two things. The first is, do the chicks rest better because they don't have the light on for 24 hours? Right. The drawer's still out. We're trying to decide on that. The other is we're thinking that the chicks like the plate more because it's more natural. It's like diving under the right. brooding hen to cuddle up. Well, a lot of people in the brooder, and this is one of those hints that I've seen along the way, is you can use like a feather duster and I've hang it in your brooder. I've actually seen... And the chicks get under it. Yes. I've actually seen a faux feather cover that you can put on top of the brooder plates. Right. It's really cute. Yeah. I can see where the chicks would feel very comforted by that. Exactly. And then on top, you are going to be with the chicks, given your own human, you know, holding them and everything else. So, yes, to be as natural as possible, the plate kind of takes place as the pretty mom. Yeah, yeah. And when we talk to Fiona, she uses the plates also. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the Brincy plates, I think, are British. It's a British company. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. So your chicks are warm and thriving and you're wondering about feeding them. So nutritional requirements for chicks. 
Chick food, first of all, is much higher in protein. Yes, much. So think about how fast a little chick goes from the palm of your hand to a bigger pullet, a bigger chick. They grow so fast. That is bone growing. That is skin. That is feather. Yeah. All those things take an immense amount of protein. Yes. It makes me think of a little bit like on the Harry Potter movies and they're like, grow the bone. And right. They hit like the wand. It's The fast. food has to be where they're getting their nutrition. 20% protein. Yeah. It has to be really, really high in protein and that for at least the first seven to eight weeks. Right. Then you can come down afterwards to 17 to 18. Mm-hmm. And you want to keep that going for a while. Yeah, like four or five months. Mm -hmm. I, on my chicks personally, I keep them on chick food until they lay. It's not always possible. Right. The last girls I did because they went into their own run. Right. So basically when the first chick laid, then I started mixing the regular feed in. That's when you switched them to a layer feed. Right. A layer feed is usually about 16% protein. Right. And it's bumped up in calcium. Exactly. So... The problem is sometimes they, when they're young, you don't want them to have as much calcium. It can affect their kidneys right. a little bit. Yeah. So when you're going into an existing flock, that's where I've had problems before where it's hard. Yeah. Because the girls that are laying eggs can't have medicated feed. Right. Because you're eating the eggs. Right. And that's when I switch at that point when okay. they go out to non-medicated chick and mix it. I'm trying to remember, because it's been two years since we've had chicks, I'm pretty sure I started to mix in, like, I will say that because we were integrating, the last... The you last, had to mix it in quicker. Right. The last batch of chicks we have are the Brahmas, and they were going in with the Swedish flowers. So I started mixing the layer food in with their food probably somewhere between four and five months so that I could switch them to layer when they were with the other girls. Yeah, Because it's hard to take... The girls who are laying off that food. Exactly. They need that extra they calcium. Need that. Exactly. So it's different. So like I had the luxury or the babies did last year of staying on until the first girl laid. Right. And so they got that extra protein all yeah, the way up. If they're going into their own coop and run, it, it's so much simpler in so many ways. Until they lay, then you put them on the layer feed. If you're integrating them into a flock that's existing, that's where it's a little bit more dicey. And you really need to get them used to the layer feed before they're out there. Yeah, you can mix it a little bit in so that I they're started more mixing used to... it a little bit at a time until they were eating more than half layer feed. Right. Yeah. So then comes the question, and we're gonna we talked about this a little bit in the beginning, is whether or not you feed medicated food. Right. Right. We can touch a little bit more on it right now. Mm-hmm. So, again, personal preference, we use medicated food. Yes, absolutely. With the medication that treats coccidiosis. Yes. The protozoa that can get into their intestines and cause bloody diarrhea. And for a little tiny chick, it can be devastating. It can be devastating and it can move so quickly it can infect your entire flock, all of your babies. So... If the vaccine isn't available, the next best thing is to feed the medicated food. Yes. And, you know, there are different viewpoints on whether or not to feed medicated or not. But again, that's a personal preference. We do do it. We feed the medicated. We don't honestly see a downside to it because, again, it's not a broad spectrum antibiotic. No. It's a thiamine blocker. It blocks vitamin B1 because B1 is what the coccidia need to develop and multiply. Right. And if you take that away from them, it kills off the coccidia in the, right. in the chick or bird system. And then you can bump them back up with some vitamins. Right. And, and get them. There's all kinds of little, like, uh, chick vitamins. Yeah. And electrolytes mm-hmm. that you can buy and add to their water. Exactly. And help with the other stuff. But I don't see a downside to feeding the medicated food. No. And then the next thing with medicated food is how long do you feed it? And a common recommendation to stop feeding it at eight weeks. I go longer. We go longer. I go longer too. I go longer because the fear is that you build up a resistance I don't to think it. there's ever been proved that coccidiosis get a resistance to the coccidiostat. I don't think that they do, but no. I'm just saying that could be where one of the right. thoughts is coming in, that maybe they would build a resistance to it. I don't see an issue. I keep them on it for as long as I can. Usually about, I'd say three or four months, I'll start to switch them to non-medicated. Yeah, and we had been lucky and had not had a case until we had the Brahmas. Right. And caramel developed coccidiosis, I want to say, there was somewhere between... 
three and four months. They were yeah. a little older. Yeah. And it progressed very quickly. It was blood. It was mm-hmm. very scary. But the medicated feed and uh, making her a hot mash with the medicated feed and keeping right. her eating went a long way in getting it taken care of. Quickly. She got that even eating the medicated feed. Yes. And so Corrid was our go-to. Right. And in a minute, we're going to talk about our chick first aid kit and some of the things we have in there. Yeah. So again, we choose to feed longer than eight weeks. Do your research, make your own decision about that. And the other thing to remember with chicks is they do not need treats for a very long time. So in the beginning, we want to hold them. Right. We want to give them like strawberries and everything else. Yeah. But honestly, they just need the nutrients in the food yes. and nothing else. Right. So giving them treats is taking away from them eating what they would eat and feed. So in the very beginning, I don't give them treats till they're out in the run, basically. When I probably do a little sooner than that. Yeah. Definitely nothing the first couple of weeks. I probably yeah. don't do anything the first month. Yeah. And then after that. But generally what I'm giving them are the kind of grains you would find in a whole grain chick food anyway. Right. And I think that the Iowa Blue Farm grower yes. would be good at that point too. Absolutely. And um, again, it has those grains in it that they can eat naturally and they do really well with. Yeah, I think, like, it's so funny. The first treats I give them are, like, little pieces of dandelions. Yeah. Because they're supposed to be really good. They're supposed to be really good for them. And then I kind of, I do move the strawberries. I don't generally, for the first few months, I don't give treats. No, they don't really need. But you want to. Right. You want to be like, oh, my God, they're so cuddly. You want to just give them something, but... Even it's best. grass, even grass, which is so natural for them to eat and they love, they really shouldn't have access to that for I, the first couple of weeks. I love when you take them out and they're in the grass for the first few times and they find a worm. Oh, it's so cute. It's the cutest thing. The it worms really are is. bigger than them yes. and they're like trying to pull them up and you're like, oh my God. They're adorable. So it's just better. And then there's the question of chick grit, whether right. or not to give it. Grit in general helps break down the food in the crop. Right. So if they eat something that's not easily broken down, the grit is going to help break it down quicker. Yeah, and most commercial chick foods are going to have have grit mixed in there at first. I probably introduce it more quickly than most people because I just want them to be in the habit of eating it. Right. They really, really need it. And I was told at one of our farm supply stores that they've just discontinued carrying it. That's just crazy to me. Well, if I can't find it, I'm telling you, I'm going to take some of the adult grit and bash it up. Yeah. Until it's small pieces for them. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. It's like the chick grit is kind of very fine. It's little teeny polished granite bits. Yeah. 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 It definitely will help that crop get used to it and get them used to eating it. They really need it to grind their food. Oh, yeah. And if you have them out in the grass at all, yeah, they need it for that. They do. Definitely, for sure. So let's move on to the chick first aid kit. Yes. Now, we've talked about in previous episode a chicken first aid kit. Yeah. And this is kind of the same but you just want to make sure if you have a chick that you have the stuff geared towards chicks also. Right, so right. when you go out and when you order, you want to start to get these things. And everybody that's going to the farm supply store has seen the little envelopes. It's like little three packs of yes. save the chick, yes. electrolytes, and probiotics. Exactly. So those are always good They're to have great on hand. on hand. You can use them with, with chickens too. They're not I, just for babies. I have them on hand at all times. Yeah, me too. In my first aid kit. Yep. The other thing that we were talking about before was, and we're going to mention this, pasty butt. Chicks can get this. It's when their stool is very soft and it sits. It sticks to them and it actually blocks them from pooping. It sticks. So it's soft and then it dries. Right. And I've had that, not a major case of it, but you just check them every day and make yep. sure nothing's on. I normally just take warm water, like on a, a, uh-huh. on a very soft cloth and just hold it there until it softens and yeah. then just wipe it off. But if it can be really bad, you have a trick, which is giving them some ground up oatmeal Yeah, in their feed. Someone told me this years and years ago, and I'm not sure if it's the starch and oatmeal, whatever it is. If you give them ground up oatmeal, it can help with the pasty butt. We did have some pasty butt with our last batch of chicks that were shipped. Mm -hmm. All we had on hand 
were the quick oats. And you can actually crumble them with your fingers. Yeah, and if not, you can just put them in a food processor. Exactly, a coffee grinder, anything like that. Yeah. Get it ground up. The chicks love them. You just sprinkle it on top of their food. They go crazy yeah. for it. Yeah, I'm sure. And so that's kind of one of the first treats you can introduce if you need to. If you need to for that. And then right. we always say the polyvisol, which chicks, you have to make sure some chicks can have a vitamin deficiency and get rye neck. Right. There's rye neck and a couple of other vitamin deficiencies that can manifest it's themselves vitamin neurologically. Vitamin E, polyvisol is definitely one that you want to have on hand. Yes. And it's infant nutrients. Right. So you're in the grocery store or the Walmart, any kind of store like that. And you could probably order it on Amazon too. I keep it in the first aid kit all year round. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. In case somebody gets sick, it's not going to be a bad thing to give. It's really rich in vitamins and nutrients. You want to make sure you buy the one without iron. Your yes. chickens do not need that extra iron. They don't need iron at all. No. And it, it's an excellent source of vitamins for several neurological right. Rhinic, vitamin deficiencies. Rhinac is a big one in the youngsters. And that's yeah. what the chicks get. Yeah. And generally, the Rhinac, they it seems to be the chick that gets pushed out a little bit more. Can be. Mm-hmm. And they're not getting the nutrients right. that they need. And as fast as that body is growing, they need to replenish and replenish and replenish. Yeah, it's very important. That you they know, get so their full complement of vitamins. Right. Another thing that's good to keep on hand is Nutri Drench. It's similar to the polyvisol. It doesn't have quite as many vitamins and minerals. Right. But the difference is Nutri Drench. As soon as you get it in their mouth, their body can absorb it. Right. This is good for chicks that won't eat. Not that you ever want to see that happen. And then the last thing you want to have is Cori, which I have at all times. Yes, definitely. Definitely. In the um, chicken first aid kit, cord is a huge thing that you need to keep right. in there. And you can read the bottle and it tells you how to dose it. Yes. If not, you can maybe call your veterinarian. They can help you with dosing. But it does give you a formula, basically. Right, there. right. right. And Corid is just another form of amprolium. Right. That if you do have a coccidiosis outbreak, even with the medicated feed, right. you want that on hand because that will save your chicken's life. In the past, I haven't had like a, a case of pasty. Milk. Right. But just anything around the back area, you just yeah. use a warm cloth right. with warm water, apply it, and soften it up, and you don't want to pull anything. No. Chick skin is very, very, very like you fragile. can tear it yes. very easily. Don't pull anything Don't off. pull anything. And once you do that, you can put a little bit of oil around the vent, like baby yeah, oil, baby oil Vaseline oil. even. Yeah, anything like that. To keep stop. it from sticking. Yes. And then, like Holly Ann said... Feed the oatmeal. And the thing with pasty bud is it kind of sounds funny. It's a funny name, but ha ha ha. It can kill them. Well, it can because then they can't poop. Exactly. And they, they, it can kill them. Sometimes you hear a chick that you know is warm, like chirping in distress. Check it for pasty butt. Oh, yeah. I, every day, multiple times, well, because we're constantly holding them. Right. But you just turn them over and look yeah. and make sure nothing's there. Exactly. And generally, you can just look in there and make sure the poop looks normal. Right. Poop is always good to be seeing in the yeah. border, not on the behinds. Honestly, your whole life with chickens, you want to look at poop. You want to see poop. It sounds <laughs> it sounds funny, but it's true. It tells yeah. you so much about the health of your chickens. Oh, yeah. So then my favorite part, which we're coming up to, is handling, <laughs> yes. where we get into a little bit of fun. And basically, you're the mama for now. I right. mean, and whoever's in your family, it's the girls and I right. here. We definitely put them in our shirts, put them, you know, on our chest, close to our hearts so they can feel our hearts. And handling them from day one is very important. It's important. But I will say this as a cautionary note. You and the girls know what you are doing oh, really yeah. well. Yeah. So if you're not quite tuned in with knowing how to keep your chicks warm. Keep them under the brooder lamp. And, you know, you can take them out, but for very short sessions to make yeah. sure they get back in. I mean, we just, we take them out. We watch some TV with them. <laughs> but handling them shows them that the hand is a good thing. Right. And not a bad thing. Right. Because down the road, if you don't handle them a lot in the beginning, treating them for something, and I'm telling you, something always comes up. Oh, there you're going to have to medicate. something, yes. There will always be something. If they're not used to your hands and you're trying to medicate them in any right. way, shape, or form, or even just check them out. Right. You won't be able to. Right. And even if you don't want to, I mean, we love a lap chicken. Oh, yeah. But even if you don't want a lap chicken, like Chrissy said, just desensitizing them to the human touch can go a very long way. Yeah, because if you have four chickens and something happens, you're going to be handling them. Or right. that's going to be handling right. them. Right. 
They have to know that the hand is not a bad thing. And we take it one step further here, the girls and I. I mean, like, we really bond them to us. Right. So you can do it in whatever kind of broad spectrum you want to do it. Right. As little or as most as you can. Because we really want ours. We don't just say it. We do hug our chickens every day. I know. So handling them is the best way to get them used to it. Yes. You cannot overestimate how harmful stress can be for your chicken. So getting them used to being handled actually cuts down on their stress. Yeah. Tremendously. So we always say this, stress can kill. Okay. So if your chicken gets something that's you can fix, but by you handling them and helping them, you're stressing them. Right. It can be just as bad. So that's why we were talking about this earlier. When something goes on, I always make sure the chickens know the garage because they're going to be coming up. Even as chicks, they start off in the garage. Right. And then that's like our secondary p- so spot for them. So they're super stressed if you have to pull them out for treatment, right? Exactly. Right. That and that sense. starts right from the beginning. Yeah. So, you know, having them in the pub. my basement is that Your basement the same is way. that place. Yeah. yeah. So, like, when they come into the garage, they're not fearing it and not knowing right. it. Right. Or, like, this winter when we had bad weather, the pop-ups are in their garage. Right. They have to know those things. Yeah. I sit it with them in the garage. Right. Tucked in because it can be colder. So, just getting them used to all those things. Yeah. So, feather development... It one, starts early. It does. So, when we say your chicks are growing fast, they are growing like crazy. Right. And they are shedding their down and growing feathers really quickly. So, they get through their first molt very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you get them and they're so cute, within yeah. days... You see real feathers sprouting through their down. And it hurts them a little bit. It can, yeah. The pin feathers coming through yes. can be painful. So that's another thing just to be aware of that the very first molt they have is those baby down feathers coming out. And, and they're another... continually replacing them right. up through a lot of their first five or six and months. Generally, they don't molt the first year at all, not until the second season. Right. They don't really need to because they've replaced they're all their new feathers, feathers so, so many times. Exactly. The downside of that is lots and lots of shed feathers and lots of dust. There's so much dust from chicks. Yeah. And that was one of the things that always had me a little worried about the heat lamp is right. the dust. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and, it can be flammable. And the down feathers flying. Right. If something fell on that heat lamp, that's that's what everybody says starts at one little spark. Right. Yeah, those feathers are starting pretty instantaneously. So here's a good tip. Once you get your chicks home and warm and fed, take a few pictures right then and there. Yeah. They're going to change within hours. So quickly. I mean, take your baby pictures. Yeah. If you're between. lucky, you can get that egg tooth on there. Yeah. I always took turns with them maybe five minutes at a time. If right. that. To get them back under the heat Two or three quickly. minutes yeah. sometimes. And then you switch. You yes. get another one and then you right. get another one and you keep them warm. Because you have to keep them warm so much. That's the most important thing. By far the most important thing. They have Your chicks will die if they get too cold. Yeah. Hypothermia sets in very quickly. Yeah. So just keeping them under the heat is good. Something we didn't mention, but it's probably important, and I know we're still figuring this out with our own brooders, but that is just watching your chicks at first to see if they're laying in a bunch or cheeping. Have you ever seen the diagrams that's out there? And I forgot who puts them out there, but it's perfect. There's diagrams that show you in your brooder where your chicks should be. Uh Uh-huh. So if you're, like, they're all under the light, Uh or I'm saying light because I'm so old school. Right, exactly. Under the heat source. If they're under the heat source, all together huddled, it's too cold. If they are all away from the heat source, it's too hot. It's too hot, right? They're trying to get... And then they show you a diagram of perfectly around everywhere. Yeah. Generally, your chicks will not be huddled. When they're really cold, they they might be huddled and cheeping. Yeah. They'll make a lot of noise if they're cold. Yeah. And so what you want is them near each other, but not... Totally squeezed together. Right. Relaxed. Sometimes you'll see, like Chrissy said, stretched out. That's like my out. favorite thing. It's really is cute. It's when they stretch out at night. Stretched out chicks. Because Joe always says, I don't see you when we get chicks at night because you're out there watching them sleep. Oh, and I'm like, so cute. it's just the cutest. It really is. And, you know, when they're stretched out and comfortably sleeping. Yeah spread out, you know that you have a good heat source. Yes. It's a good thing. So We mentioned the thermometers and the instant heat read. They're such good tools to have on hand. Oh, yeah. Just to keep checking and making sure. Because, again, your chicks can become hypothermic quickly yeah. if they're not getting their adequate heat. Yeah. So that's, like, one of the major things. It's just the warmth in the beginning. Now, outside time. 
Yes. We give a lot of outside time as they grow feathers. Right. So after, I'd say, two to three weeks. Exactly. The first two weeks, they're definitely in. We're in holding them when they're out. Right. When they're back in shortly. Uh-huh. After three weeks, I, I take, them, out, three weeks, take yeah. them outside. Right. And it, it's so funny because our neighbors have got to be like, oh, my goodness, the Carlos are so crazy chicken people because the girls and I will be laying on a big blanket and then the chicks will be all around us Aww. and we're just snapping a million pictures. Yeah. And they need that sun just as much as your older girl needs they it. They definitely need that sunlight, especially if they're in a birder where they're not getting any kind of natural light. Right. They really need, and it can be very short sessions, but they definitely need that sunlight. It also gets them used to eating grass. Right. Scratching in the dirt. All those natural chicken behaviors. It's so cute to watch them first scratch around and it walk around. It is adorable. And then it gets to the point where you can't catch them. And then you're chasing them around the yard. Well, that's where the pop-ups come in. Yeah. So we have the big pop-ups. We zip the bottom off, place it on the grass, and put them inside and zip the top. And you know what I've done? I have the big pop-ups that don't have the bottom come off, but it does have the top and uh-huh. everything. I just put the shavings in there and put that in the yard for a while. That's true. So they're not getting the grass, but they're getting the sunlight. They're getting the sunlight. Like, usually when I garden in early spring, the pop-up's right next to me. Yeah. And they're just staring at me. And we're not talking about unsupervised. Your chicks have to be supervised every minute. And that pop-up is not going to protect them from a fox, from a hawk. They can rip right through it. So they can't be just sitting out. And the other thing is, yeah, the other thing is the pop-up can be in too much sunlight. So if it's too warm, you have to move it into a shady spot. Right. They have to be supervised. You know, we were saying two or three weeks, but like this year, we got our chicks very early. Yeah. So this year, we probably wouldn't, I wouldn't be taking chicks outside if it's less than like 60 or 65 degrees. Yeah, exactly. No way. Yeah. They definitely need it warmer than that. What we also do, because last year, we got the girls at the end of March and April was cold. Yeah. So off of our kitchen, we have a laundry room and we close the door Uh from the dogs. Right. And then the three of us sit in the laundry room and the chicks just run around. Let them run around the floor. Yeah, that's a good idea too. And then we put our legs out and they crawl all over you. They poop on you. And then you're like, ah, (laughs) they pooped on me. Oh no. So it's one of those things, you know? They don't have a, like if your your birdie hen is hatching, your chicks, she's going to take the chicks outside and teach them how to do that stuff. And basically you're taking the place of the birdie hen. Exactly. So you're letting them have that natural chicken time. The other thing, which, okay, I saw something really new and cute on Amazon. It's the multi perch for your chicks. We saw that too. It's adorable. And we make our own perches for the babies. We do, yeah. So easy to do. Even if you're not handy, you just nail two pieces into a piece into two little legs and you got a perch. I always put the roosting bar in the brooder yes. from the very beginning. Oh, we don't usually put ours in right away. I put it in the first day. Okay. And believe it or not, sometimes you'll see them like oh, trying to get out it. there. I believe it. But I have it in there because it just instinctually they'll want to do it when they're ready. Yeah, they want to roost. And I just want it higher. available for them. Yeah, so we, yeah. Joe makes these little ones that we stick in there. They're he so makes cute. Them too. They're really cute. And we saw one on Amazon that had like three different roosting yeah, levels. It had, yeah, so they could get even higher. And it was called like a chick jungle gym or something. Something. So you could even take it outside. Yeah, you could. When you have them exercising, they always fly in our little bushes when they go outside. <laughs> oh, that's cute. And I'm like, can't get them. Then they run under the bush. And I'm like, oh my goodness. But perching is a natural behavior. It is. Now, I will say that, again, I thought the commercial perches were adorable. But a lot of them were round. They were like round dowel rods. Oh, yeah. I don't like my chicks on round perches. We, yeah, we never use round. We just basically use use a flat piece. Exactly. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying I don't care for it. I think it can be hard on their feet to try to hold on that way. Yeah, exactly. A lot of times they're not doing much on it unless they're a little bit bigger. Right. But I've never used the round dowels either. No. So it might be neat to either make something like that or if you get it, use it outside. Right, yeah. yeah. For a little while. And here's the thing. If you get it, chances are with chickens, and if you really enjoy it, you're going to get more chicks. Probably. (laughs) No use it again. Yeah. I remember when I started, I told you, we're only going to have four chickens. Ha, ha, ha. (laughs) And then I soon discovered that as in all animals in my life, I love chickens. Yes. I love all animals. My whole life has been dedicated to animals. First being a nurse for animals for over 15 years and then having my own animals. I 
think that there's just something so charming about chickens and the breeds are so fascinating that it's just easy to want more of them. It is. You look at them and you're like, oh, that would be great. Oh, that would be great. Oh, it's this year was terrible. <laughs> because we're doing the breed spotlight every week and we're looking at all these different breeds. <laughs> all the and chickens. to be honest, it's hard to find anything really bad with any animal, especially a chicken. Right, right. So really for so, us it came down to what breeds would fit best into our existing situations. Right. So I mean I have a laid back flock. Yeah. So I need laid back chickens. Yeah. So not only for the kids. But for chickens that we have. Right, right. So that's the thing. When you're looking for the chick that you're going to get, think about your existing flock that they are going into. Exactly. Unless they're getting their own coop and yard. Then you don't have to worry about it. Then you don't have to worry about it. But otherwise, it's good to have compatible breeds if you can. So if you have a layback chicken, like any breed of Warpington, they're laid back. Right. I mean, majorly. I have Warpingtons and Cuckoo Morans together. My Cuckoo Morans love me and will snuggle with me. But they're a bossy chicken to the other chickens. Yeah. And somehow my two Orpingtons have held their ground. I and know. They're still number one I, in it there. It must be seniority because they really do rule that. that they coo- rule that roost. Yeah, they, they rule do. it. And those cuckoos are like trying as hard as they can, but it doesn't help. <laughs> so when you think of chicks, think about your existing flock. Yeah. Because you will save yourself. Here's the thing we haven't mentioned on here, but we should as part of chicks is integration. Yeah, that we're actually going to give that its own episode. That's going to have its own episode. Yeah. But here, integration is a big deal. And listen in for what we have to say about it before. But it's not something to be taken lightly. Keeping the chickens inside, I generally keep them up to 12 weeks in. Yeah, we have to. I was thinking about that. We have to, yeah. After that becomes the real work. Yeah. Because then if you have an existing flock, that's your integration. Right. And we're, like you said, we're doing a whole episode on this. Yeah. And that'll be a little later in the season when it's closer to the time that you're going to be integrating these chicks. Right. There are just a few things you can do to ease this transition. Right. It takes time and patience. It does. But there are a few things you can do to ease this transition just to make it easier for your chickens and you because it can be stressful for everybody involved. So until all that, like I think we've covered all the more serious facts. Yeah, I mean, but the, the one tip we have left is to make sure that you have some kind of a cover for your brooder. Always. For for a lot of various reasons, like keeping so the you're dogs inside out, the house. Right. If your brooder's inside the house and somebody flies out, you're not there. Right. The dog's natural instinct will not be, hey, this is yeah, a chick, the, I'm going to leave it alone. The sweetest dog in the world is going to want to go after a chick that's flying around. Right. And it's surprising how even the heavyweight breeds can fly as chicks. Here's the other thing a uh, cover can help your brooder with. I use the cover. I use chicken wire. Okay. Okay. Mine's very primitive. Two big logs. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. With chicken wire, and they're wrapped around the logs. Yeah, that's perfect. And then it hangs. The lamp would hang right above that. Say the lamp, for whatever reason, breaks. Right. It's falling on the lid. It's not falling in on the chicks. It's not falling in on the chicks and igniting the shavings. Right. Exactly. So, I don't know. Maybe I just worry about all this stuff, but it's good to be prepared. It is good to be prepared. My burner lid is even more primitive. It's a window screen. Oh, yeah. I have books on it. (laughs) A giant window screen. If anybody's out there and it's a first time getting chicks or even the second time or third or fourth and you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to DM us or email us with your questions. Yeah, reach out. We'll we'll be happy to help you as much as we can. We'll be happy to help you with anything that we know. It's a lot to learn, a lot to know. And if you're doing it, it's because you love chickens and you want to get it right. So there's a lot of information out there. Good, useful information. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like you said, sometimes it's hard to sit and have the time to read multiple books. Right. You're looking for some good information out there. And if you need to, give us an email. So now that we've gone over all this information, I feel like we've been more serious this time, but we had to because there's so much information to get out there for everyone. Yeah. We want to say enjoy your babies. Have fun. Don't take your eyes off of them for long because they are they, they grow so fast. They grow faster than real kids. Yeah, they really do. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you ha- mean real kids? <laughs> Humans, like human kids. Human kids. So have fun. Enjoy the ride. And put lots of pictures out there. We love seeing everybody's pictures, especially chick pics. It makes us just want more babies and more babies. Because that's what we need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so we hope you enjoyed this special bonus episode. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us or DM us and we'll help you the best that we can. And until next time, everybody, what should we do? Enjoy your babies and hug your chicks. Every day. Don't forget to hug and kiss them. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show so that we can bring you even more high-quality chicken content, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.